only one hero can save her family and prevent disaster. Mom, we're gonna be late for school. I don't think so. Whoa. Experience the phenomenon that critics are calling inspiring. Mom, I can't find number 17. Come on, Billy. Dig deep. A lot of fun. And pure genius. Mom, where's my phone? Table. Keys. Mudroom. Dragon Man. Under the couch between the monkey and the flip-flop. How does she do that? Created by God to demonstrate his love with grace, elegance, and poise. Have you seen my butane torch?
Bills. Amen. Hey, how's everybody doing this morning? Good. So glad you're here on this Mother's Day. It's such a special day. Hey, as we continue this service, why don't you do me a favor? Walk around the room. Why don't you say hi to somebody? Introduce yourself to somebody. Shake hands. Give somebody a fist bump, hug. Welcome to Cornerstone this morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. Glad you're here this morning. And uh, hey, as, as I just looked out the window out there a little bit ago, you might have noticed there's all kinds of flowers sitting along the walk out there. Those are for moms. So please, if, uh, if, you're, if your mom's not here or your wife's not here or something, grab one for her on the way out. If you're a mom in here, grab a flower on the way out. That's for you to take home. And uh, it's just our way of blessing you this morning. Um, Kids Connect is going to be finishing up next week. will be the last week for Kids Connect. The nursery will still be open throughout the summer, but Kids Connect will start up again in September after next week. Uh, next week, we're going to honor our graduates, our college and high school. So if you have a graduate and you haven't sent a baby picture and a current picture yet, we would love to have that. You can email that to the church office early this week. Our final United House for our youth was coming up on May 23rd, and there might be some things that they're going to be doing during the summer, but they'll be getting that information out later. But the regular meetings on Wednesday nights, May 23rd is the last night for that until after summer. Uh, Women's Night coming up on June 5th also, so lots of stuff going on. Um, I'd like to invite the ushers forward at this time, and if you're a guest, just please let the basket pass. We're just happy that you're here to worship with us. And you can also give with your, set, with your cell phone by texting CCC people to 77977. All right, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you especially for moms today. But we also thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless these gifts. We ask you to guide us and lead us as we try to use them to glorify your name, to spread your word throughout this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd love to share a song with you this morning. And... Uh, the song is really cool. It talks about what God did on that cross. He saved our lives. He gave us salvation. We were alone in our sorrow. We were dead in our sin, but God saved us. That's what this song talks about. If you, if you know it, please sing along. If you don't, there are words, but we'd love you to, to join us in worship this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over.
We need to sing out more time. We sing, oh, your grace is so free. Oh, your grace so free. Wash is
praises to your name. And I'm so grateful that we can come together as a family, as a church family, and sing praises to your name, sing our hearts out to you, and we get to hear an awesome uh, word coming from you. Thank you for our moms and what they mean to us. We love you, Jesus. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, uh, Mother's Day, for some people, is one of the hardest days of the year because it stirs up all kinds of memories that are unwelcome, sometimes unhappy, and almost unmanageable for some. For some people, this is the first and, or, or maybe one of the first Mother's Days that they have been without their mom. And it's, it's just an unavoidable reminder of their loss. Uh, it's full of memories. And that, among other things, means it's full of grief. The, the empty chair at the dinner table is a, a reminder of their loss. For some, Mother's Day is a reminder that their mom was, well, not a good mom. May have not even been a good person. They were abusive and neglectful, and absent. These people don't have a nice pastel basket with a bow on it full of mom's memories. And then for other women who are longing to be a mom but who haven't been able to, this is a really tough day. This is a day that reminds them of who they aren't and it makes them wonder if they ever will be a mom or if they ever should be. For all these people, Mother's Day is a hard day. For some of them, it's hurtful. And I would be insensitive if I didn't acknowledge that up front and just say, I, the last thing I want to do is make somebody's pain deeper today. I want to say thanks. If you're one of the people that I've just talked about, I want to say thank you for having the courage to be here today on a day that you, you, you might have wanted to be somewhere else. Thank you for being here on what for you is probably a difficult day. And I'd love to pray for you. The Father, Abba, a lover of the brokenhearted and God who is our perfect parent on this day that for some is a, a wonderful day of happiness and joy but for others is a, well it's anything but that I pray for your grace to visit each one to bind up wounds to provide comfort that you would speak to each one of us above every other thing of how deeply we are loved by you. And I pray
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The text this morning is Proverbs 31, the entire chapter. There are Bibles under the seats, and you're always, you know, if you don't have a Bible that you really understand, we, this is a new international version. I think it would be some, uh, a version you could easily understand. If you don't have a, a good Bible, we want you to take one of those that are under the seats. That's why we put them here. And you may want to just go old school this morning and open up one of those Bibles a little to the right of halfway to the book of Proverbs at the very end of the book of Proverbs to chapter 31. The sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what, they, what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband is, has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. This is my favorite Bible passage for Mother's Day, but probably not for the reason that you might think. I know there are preachers all over that this morning are going to open this up and out of it, they're going to pull out of the model for the ideal Christian woman and wife. It's, it's a bright, shining job description. This is an amazing profile of an amazing woman. When I read it, I get this picture in my head. Man, she's awesome and beautiful and powerful. I mean, look at this profile. This woman is into virtually everything. She crafts and sews. She works with her hands. She makes her family's wardrobes. She, uh, she's an entrepreneur. She buys and sells property, land at a profit. She sells her handiwork to merchants. She's physically strong. And she seems to need nearly no sleep at all or at least not very much, her lamp is on well into the night, and she's up before, well, while it's still dark. She's a horticulturist. She's a vintner. She's a Michelin chef. She's open-hearted and open-handed to the poor. She's wise and well-spoken. She's dignified and poised. Her kids idolize her, and her husband is nuts about her. 
So about the only thing that was left off this list was she has a PhD in physics from MIT. Who wouldn't want to be her, right? Kind of like who wouldn't want to be Wonder Woman? But you know, there's this other side to that same coin. I wonder how many women read this and feel incredibly inadequate. If I was you, I would be. How can anybody live up to measuring up to being like Wonder Woman? I, you pretty much can't. There's, there's this one thing, though, that got left off the text. She doesn't exist. I'm thinking the key to this is back in verse 1 where uh, Lemuel writes, The sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. And then there are nine verses that are absolutely fabulous. If I was king of the world, I'd make every uh, government official um, have this read at their swearing-in ceremony. It's all about how to wisely govern and take care of people. It's good stuff, all of it, and it's from the mouth of Lemuel's mother. Now, most Bibles have an artificial division between verse 9 and verse 10, but in ancient manuscripts, there's no division there. there verse 9 flows into verse 10. There's, there's really no reason to take that the voice narrating verse 9 changes at verse 10. I think it's the same person. I still think it's King Lemuel's mother. Now, think about that for a minute, okay? And I don't want to be racist here, but you have to at least think ethnically about what is in here in order to get how I'm thinking. King Lemuel was a Jewish king. That's pretty much all we know about him because this is the only place in the Bible that he shows up. And we only get the fact that he's Jewish and a king. That's it. There are, are several theories about who Lemuel was, and the one I like the best is that it was actually Solomon and that Lemuel was a pet name that his mother gave him because in Hebrew, Lemuel means devoted to God. So this was King Lemuel's mom's pet name for him. Of course, you know who Lemuel's, Solomon's mom was, right? Bathsheba. There's a whole sermon right there, but I won't go into that. You can choose almost any theory of who King Lemuel was, and you would be as close to the theories that historians can propose. No matter who you think he is, you have to go with the idea that what we have preserved for us as the chapter 31 of Proverbs are the inspired words of his mother, his Jewish mother. Sorry, I'm sorry for the stereotyping on that, but let this Jewish mother thing kind of sink in a little bit, right? Boy, they... Listen, Jewish mothers didn't get their reputation for no reason at all. Boy, they. I'm thinking that King Lemuel's Jewish mother is writing up a job description for her daughter-in-law, right? For the wife of his, this woman who is sort of worthy of her amazing, wonderful son, the answer to her prayers, the one who hangs the moon, her bubula, the king. He deserves more than just your average run-of-the-mill Jewish girl, right? And so here it is. Well, he needs Wonder Woman. And by the way, there's an irony in that. If you've seen the Wonder Woman movie thing, you know that Gal Gadot is a, a, she's Hebrew. She's a Jewish woman. I thought it was ironic. It seems to me, within the straight and narrow, to read a little bit of a Yiddish accent into Proverbs chapter 31. And for me, this explains chapter 31 way better than proposing that Wonder Woman is an Old Testament character when everybody knows she comes from an island nation of Amazon women in a comic book world. So, 
So, Mom, what's in this for you today? Well, is the point in this you get with it and be perfect? Your Wonder Woman costume and the lasso of truth are hanging in the closet, but you don't get them until you're perfect. That's not what I want you to get at all. I want your children to arise and call you blessed. I want your husband to praise you and say, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. I, I want this for all moms. Every single mom, I guess in the world, but especially in this room. But I don't want you to get there by trying to be perfect. Because the reality is that you being trying to be perfect will not get you the kind of love and admiration that you most want. And you see kind of exposed here in this passage. The, the truth is what you being trying to be perfect will get you is the opposite. It will get you the resentment, maybe even the bitterness of your kids and your husband. And here's why. Because nobody really feels loved by a perfectionist. They feel often condemned, but they don't feel loved. They feel judged, but they don't feel accepted and embraced emotionally by a perfectionist. Being perfect is an unrealistic expectation anyway, and it's never going to get you what you want most as a mom. I kind of look at this whole thing as an over-the-top job description, and right after the title of wife and mother, there should be this, you know, fine print, the imperfect need not apply. It's tough. What are we supposed to do with this? I mean, it's in the Bible. Was King Lemuel and his Jewish mother, were they just punking us? Were they just rattling our cage? Is this really what God expects of you, Mom? This kind of perfection? Well, I think the point of this whole thing is in the last two verses where this is what we have. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. I don't care who you are. This is a truth you cannot avoid because it universally applies to everyone. I don't care, even if you've got tons and buckets full of $1,000 bills to pay a surgeon, uh, just ask Goldie Hawn. Sorry, Goldie, but you can't run. You can run from him. You'll never outrun Father Time. I don't care how you try to mask it. You can pretend otherwise, you can deny it to yourself, you can deny it to the world, but charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Doesn't matter how much money you've got in your deep, deep pockets or how good your Hollywood surgeon is, beauty is fading. So, now, hear me. I'm not saying don't pay attention to your appearance. I'm not saying don't wear makeup. I'm not saying it's wrong for you to look sharp. I want you to look sharp. What I am saying is really the same thing that 2,000 years ago the Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. I don't think Peter was saying, don't wear gold jewelry, don't wear your hair up, and don't wear nice clothes. I don't think he was saying that at all. But what I think he was saying is, don't fool yourself into thinking that these things are going to make you beautiful, because they won't. In other words... Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting. Your charm and your beauty need to come from something other than your outward appearance, your physical appearance. Lemuel's Jewish mom gives us some more insight. 
But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all her hands have done. And let her works bring her praise at the city gate. See, a woman who fears the Lord, that's the point. If you want to just summarize the entire profile, a woman who fears the Lord. A woman who is beautiful because of her inner beauty, her inner self, because of her character, because of her spirit. That's where the real value is. That's the real target. She does a ton, and she deserves honor for all of that. But she doesn't do these things in order that God will love her more. She does them because she knows she is loved by Him. She knows that there's nothing she can do that would ever make God love her more, and there's nothing she could ever do that would ever make Him love her more less. She's not trying to score brownie points with God. She's doing these things because her heart is right. She loves God. She loves her husband. She loves her kids. And what she does, how she excels, is the result of love. Getting, if you get love and doing turned around backwards, you wind up in a chokehold. You wind up on an endless treadmill of performance that you can never live up to. It's lethal. I know. I know you, Mom. I know that at your best, you do these things, these incredible, unselfish, heroic things because of love. It's it's your bottom line. It's your core motivation. Your family doesn't seem to get that, though, right? About the only time they notice is when supper's late or when they don't have clean clothes for school or work or when you turn around for 10 lousy seconds and your three-year-old has pulled every stinking thing out of every cupboard out onto the floor four minutes before company gets there, right? Well, the world doesn't notice. I mean, in fact, as an observer, it looks to me like the world wants to push you clear out of this role of wife and mom. They want you to bust through the glass ceiling. They want you to be a world changer and a trendsetter. And honestly, if that's what God has in mind for you, that's what I want for you too. I want you to be amazing beyond anybody's imagination, even your own. But I don't want you to give up something more important for any of those achievements. Be the CEO. Be a world changer. Get out there and kick up some big rocks. I'm with you. But don't forget the most important job that God has ever given you and will ever give you in your entire life. Don't forget that M-O-M is way better than CEO. I don't care what you're the CEO of. I am really not trying to get you to be the perfect Proverbs 31 woman. All I want, really, is for you to be you. I want you to be the woman that God had in mind for you to be before he ever spun the planets out into space. I want you to be the you that he thought up. I, I want you to know that he is nuts about you on your worst day, on the day that you think you should have your mom license revoked. He thinks you're fabulous. I want you to know that when you love God and you love your family, you make our God happy even when you're not perfect at doing this. I want you to give yourself permission to pursue this high, high calling of motherhood with your whole self. Give it your all in partnership with God. And then there's this one more thing. I want your family to slow down and pay attention. I want them to give you 
the praise that you deserve. For crying out loud, I'm talking about one day a year. Can't we at least do that? Kids, your mom needs to hear from you. You need to arise and call her blessed. Well, what in the world is that? Okay, let me just tell you a couple of things. You need to say to her in words, if you don't have guts enough to say it out loud to her face, at least write it on a piece of paper and tell her how glad you are that she's your mom. It doesn't have to be perfect for you to want that. No, a lot of you guys, junior high and senior high kids, are probably going... Right, you don't know my mom. No, I don't know. Well, I might. But I'll tell you this. Ask one of your friends, and they'll tell you that their mom is way worse than your mom. And your mom needs to know that you love her. You don't agree with her. And hey, for her to be a great mom, she doesn't have to always agree with you. But she needs to hear from you, from your lips. That she's a blessing from God in your life. And dad, you need to praise her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. I'm pretty sure you're probably going to let Hallmark say that for you with a card. And by the way, guys, if you haven't bought one yet, get yourself to Casey's and buy something. Okay, even a payday bar. That'd be better than nothing. <clears throat> but I'm challenging you today, dads, to say it out loud, to make it common, normal vocabulary for you. Tell her. Tell her. You know, there's that old tired joke about the couple that had been married for 50 years and they were sitting on the front porch rocking back and forth in their rocking chairs and the wife looks at the husband and says Henry in the past 50 years I haven't heard you say I love you since our wedding and Henry looked at her and he said well if it changes I'll let you know don't be Henry boys tell her very few things in all of your life marriage and family life will make as much difference in her life as hearing from you that you are convinced you got the best end of this deal. I know a lot of guys that this is true of. I married way over my head. I have a friend who said I I outpunted my coverage. It's not hard. But sometimes it is hard, and I don't know, other than just pride. Tell her. Tell her often. Give, make Mother's Day just an excuse for you to do what you want to do every day. Let's pray. Lord, there are moms here who feel discouraged and defeated, and they just wonder, why in the world would you do why would you make them a mom? They just feel so inadequate and so beaten up. Would you breathe your grace and your life into their heart today? I, I so want them to know that they are your treasure, your workmanship, your masterpiece, your poem. And their moms uh, here of uh, teenage kids that they... I mean, it's taken their breath away to think about what is ahead. Would you breathe hope and encouragement into them? They're moms of empty nests. Remind them that as their kids grow up and leave home and make their own life, that this is not punishment but a reward for their good work. And for every grandmother who is here, remind them of what a great thing happened when they didn't kill their kids when they were teenagers and they got to be grandparents my prayer is a prayer of blessing on every mom and grandmother in this room and I pray it in Jesus name amen ladies don't forget there are flowers out there for you would you stand with me and turn to somebody before you 
leave your area and say, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Christ, the